afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm delighted to act as uh, chair for this session, introducing Stephanie Rumpser's Phenomenology of the Icon, Mediating God Through the Image, which will soon be published by Cambridge University Press. Um, I'm Charlie Barber, the Donald Drew Egbert Professor in the Department of Archaeology at Princeton University. Um, a little bit of housekeeping to begin with. Uh, for those of you who are new to this forum, please keep yourselves muted during the presentations. If you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of the screen. And once Stephanie is finished with her sort of introduction of the work, um, I'll, I'll then sort of work our way through those questions um, on your behalf. Um, now, without further ado, let me introduce our author to you. Uh, Stephanie Rumser is a researcher in philosophy at the Sorbonne Université Paris 4. Uh, her research focuses on three primary areas, the development and reception of contemporary French phenomenology, the relationship between philosophy and theology, and the question of mediation in image and word. The icon which has relevance to each of these three areas has been at the center of Stephanie's recent articles and book chapters, and is central to the book to which this session is dedicated. That is, again, to repeat the title, Phenomenology of the Icon, Mediating God Through His Image. Now, I think there are several aspects of this study to which I'd like to draw your attention, just to, in a sense, Get a, get, get a start in some ways. The book both builds upon and surpasses the fundamental phenomenological work of Hans-Georg Gardner and Jean-Luc Marion. It asks us to contemplate the work performed by the icon itself, foregrounding its mediating role. This icon brings us into the presence of a person who listens. Held by the gaze of this subject, we are provoked into prayer. It is love given by the one looking and by the one, and, and also given by the one looked upon that both embraces the finite properties of the medium and conveys the one who exceeds the conditions of representation to us. The study is philosophically astute and theologically committed. It makes the icon profoundly and lovingly personal. Now I'd like to invite Stephanie to offer a more eloquent and a fuller introduction to her work. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie, first of all. That was already a, quite an eloquent and succinct uh, presentation of my aim, and also Petros uh, for inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, as Charlie noted, I'm not actually in Byzantine studies. I am primarily a philosopher, uh, and this isn't a book that is explicitly Byzantine studies, but I've drawn a lot out of uh, reading uh, from Byzantine scholars, and I hope that I can bring something back in return. So the primary question that I ask in this book is that of mediation, um, especially when it comes to a mediation of an infinite God. How is it possible for a finite thing to mediate something that's infinite? Because just if you do the simple math, uh, it seems like it should be impossible. Something that is finite has its limits, and if it tries to contain the infinite, uh, you either have only this much of the infinite, which is by definition not the infinite, and we might call this an idolatry, as it has something less than and would lie if it claims to have the whole, or uh, it would have to just completely shatter uh, in order to try to in some way contain or meld into the infinite. But then you could ask, well, does it even have its identity as a finite thing anymore? So it would seem that this logic of mediation sets up an intrinsic competition between the infinite God and the finite creature. And if there's a competition between us and God, we can assure ourselves that we are not <laughs> the victors. So this is a real problem. Uh, and at the same time, we know that many religions uh, clearly by their practice uh, believe that there is an answer. Uh, and so there are many different ways that we could go about trying to find this answer. But my approach in this book is to ask about the specific practice and tradition of the Byzantine icon. What is it that this icon does that makes it such a cherished example of the mediation of an infinite God? How does it do this without falling into these two extremes of idol idolatry and iconoclasm? I'm gonna focus rather than go through a detailed outline of the book, um, I'm gonna focus on 
what I think are two or three major areas that might be of interest to those who are working primarily in uh, Byzantine studies. And the first of this is the approach that I take through phenomenology. Um, as many of you probably know, many Byzantine art historians have already used uh, phenomenologically inspired thinking uh, to very helpful effect, I think. Uh, we have people looking at the icon as a part of material culture, examining it in the lived experience that engages all of the senses, for example, in the liturgical event. Uh, and these are all uh, really helpful studies that I, I've drawn upon in this work. Uh, but at the same time, phenomenology actually, well, it does look at experience, it does much more than look at sense experience. And so I think that by widening the scope of phenomenology to a more rigorous philosophical background, we can actually even get more out of this method. So let me just say a few things about what that would be. So phenomenology assumes, first of all, that appearing is not a mask or a cloak over being that we have to uh, you know, translate to get at the reality of things. Uh, rather, it's, it holds that phenomenality or appearing is simply the way that being gives itself to us. So it's being's self-giving. And in order to better access being self-giving, uh, we have to first set aside prior uh, conceptions, prior theories, prior assumptions. Uh, to really focus on what is giving itself to me and also how I am receiving it. So there's this double-sided touch that's important to consider. Now, sense perception does really have a, a priority in this philosophical method because this is the way in which a physical thing is fully present to my senses. Uh, it gives itself in the fullness of its flesh and blood presence. Uh, but there are actually other ways that things give themselves to us. For example, in memory or imagination, um, language, ideation, et cetera. And we can look at all of these practices. They all have their different structures. So in looking at the icon in particular, I draw upon two major thinkers to kind of develop a framework of analysis. One is Hans Georg Gadamer. He's a student of Heidegger's and also of ancient Greek thought. And he develops a hermeneutically sensitive phenomenology of the artwork, uh, which brings it into the context of a world inside of a community with its own uh, sense of space and time. Uh, it gives us the enriched truth of the original in an event of an encounter and leads us to a better understanding of ourselves and our belonging to the whole of the world. Similarly, uh, I also draw on the work of Jean-Luc Marion, who has talked about this question of how God can show himself the experience because the icon is an image of God. We're gonna need to ask the question of how can we experience an infinite God? Marion takes a very different approach than philosophers are sometimes tempted to take, uh, where we sort of need the right kind of concepts or mechanism to build our way slowly, a ladder where we eventually get to a perspective of God, perhaps a chain of analogy or, or something like that. Marion says, quite simply, we're finite, we can never reach God. But that doesn't prevent God from reaching us. And so there's a reversal of perspective, and Marion actually uses this word icon not in the, the concrete sense, but to discuss this reversal where I come before a God who's already made the initiative to approach me. So bringing these together, I then look at the icon in four different dimensions, uh, representation and the, the icon as an image, it's particular features as an image, the icon as presence or personal encounter, as substitution, uh, the, a body to be kissed or touched, and performance, uh, the icon in its context of liturgical prayer and that space, time, and community that gathers there. Now, each of these can be understood from a human level, uh, but each of them, I argue, also changes when we take it seriously as an act of prayer. And this, I think, is the second point that might interest uh, scholars of Byzantine studies. The icon was made, if we really think about it, by those who pray and for use in prayer. Now, it is always a little bit tricky to navigate between the worlds of the past and the worlds of the present. But I do think that this structure of prayer is a universal possibility for human beings. And there may be different variations of it than the one that I give. It may be different, say, in different religions. I imagine a Buddhist does not mean the same thing uh, about prayer than a, a Orthodox Christian. But I do think insofar as uh, Byzantine culture engaged in practices of prayer before the icon, they would be doing something more or less what we can describe today when we, what believers are doing now before the icon. 
Now, I'm also not saying that we have to pray to get something out of the icon. I think there are very legitimate uh, ways to explore the icon through history or through material culture as, as people have already done. Uh, but, and I'm also not saying that we have to think that it's legitimate to pray when looking at the structure of prayer. But if we do want to understand the icon as it gives itself to believers in this tradition, we really do have to take seriously that this is a different kind of act and it gives it gives the, the phenomenon of the icon to us in a different kind of way than other aspects of uh, other practices or acts in, in human experience. Uh, let me give very briefly uh, in brief sketches two examples. So the first is substitution. Now, as probably many of you know, the icon is often described as having a special force of um, metaphysical participation or in hypostasization that allows it to have some kind of special connection to the original saint that it represents. I'm not really persuaded by that. It might be true, it might not be, but I think that we can describe it even better simply through phenomenological continuity with experience. Um, if you've ever seen the film Lethal Weapon, it, one of the opening scenes has Mel Gibson crying and kissing a picture of a woman wearing a wedding dress. Uh, obviously, he does not believe that there is a woman uh, in the picture or, or that, that this, this uh, picture has a kind of real hypothetical presence in a special metaphysical way, but he's communicating something real about a person who is absent. And I think the same continuity uh, can help us understand what people are doing when they would kiss an icon, except that in the action of prayer, something changes. It's no longer an expression merely of my strong feelings for a person who is absent. Now it is a belief that there's a real communication happening. And so this, this in, opens up a whole new possibility of action. So for example, it's now meaningful practice for me to kiss an icon every time I walk into church, uh, if I believe that you know the, the saints and, and Christ is listening to me there. Uh, as opposed to only needing to, you know, express my feeling when I'm when I'm feeling very worked up about someone or something. Uh, another example, very briefly, is the liturgy. So the the liturgy is a very powerful aesthetic event, or it can be. But if someone goes to the liturgy to pray, the aesthetics of the liturgy are secondary. It doesn't really matter how beautiful or ugly the music is. The primary point is to put yourself in before the presence of God, whatever your current experience or feelings are. So let me back up uh, and give you a definition very briefly that I've worked out of what prayer can be understood from a phenomenological perspective. Um, so prayer is to place oneself before the presence of a God who we believe is present to us always. Uh, who is already present. It is not about feeling or experience. It is about a relationship. It is not confirmed that anything about this relationship is true or real. There's no unambiguous confirmation at least. Uh, and therefore we lack the measure of the success of this action, which would be different say in perception. Um, it also involves a act of self dispossession to a God that we utterly depend on a stance of radical poverty or total self-gift or love or kenosis. Uh, there are many different words that we can use to describe this action. And in doing this, those who pray believe they receive themselves back again in a new way. Um, and Marion uses this poem to describe this wonderful analogy about a fountain uh, where each level of the fountain is always receiving water as long as it continues to give the water on. Uh, but if it were to try to grasp what is offered and try to grasp at this relation of love or prayer or openness that can be possible, uh, it would, by that very action, withdraw from this possibility of receiving. And in fact, I think that this is, if you want to boil it down to its essence, this is the stance that the, S, the icon is trying to teach us. And it's, it's not an action, <laughs> an accident that I'm making this gesture. This is, of course, the gesture of Orans, which I think is a physical um, symbol or embodiment of the interior posture of prayer. Uh, and that's one of the things, again, that the icon teaches us in, in the visual language. Uh, so we're, we're probably about at our time um, for questions. Let me just very briefly say um, that I think I had mentioned that the, the primary way that I make my argument about mediation is through looking at the icon. 
But I also have a kind of running argument on the side that comes in at the end, uh, which is an argument by metaphor. And I, I told you at the beginning that uh, the way that I set up this problem of mediation was think about a finite thing as trying to contain an infinite God. And just this, this doesn't work, this isn't possible. Well, part of the reason this isn't possible is this is already iconoclasm, this very framing of the problem. And I think in order to really think about the possibility of mediating God, we need a new framework. Um, and this kind of technological utilitarian framework is very common to us uh, in our everyday lives in the 21st century. Uh, but I suggest another framework that perhaps can address uh, the real problematic of mediation would be that of a love letter. Uh, a love letter has this way of combining the richness of a horizontal access uh, of the world of experience. Everything matters in a love letter. All of the details are cherished. But at the very same time, nothing really is that important. Everything is substitutable because what's really important in the end is not that it was written by email or in a paper or that the ink was green or black, but that this is a real communication with a person. And I think the icon sort of preserves both of these axes together. Um, yes, and I think that's what that's what that's what philosophy uh, can learn about the mediation from the icon.